Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Hiring a virtual assistant used to be difficult for many reasons, but it's become more popular over the last few years. There are many professional groups, platforms, and agencies that can help you find the person or people you need with the right skills to make sure you're successful in growing your team and your business. Today's guest is Pavel Stepanov, the founder and CEO of VirtuDesk, a subscription-based personnel solution for small and medium-sized businesses. They've been around for five years and have over 600 employees working full-time for clients around the world. We talked about why did you want to work with VAs and help them find jobs? How can VAs help you scale? How can you go looking for VAs to hire? Are contracts necessary? What are the most common methods of payment? How do you handle weird payment requests outside of normal payments? You'll also learn things like how do you prepare yourself for hiring a VA? Hire for your weaknesses, not your strengths. Why you need standard operating procedures. Why you need to create job descriptions. Why you need hard skills tests. Why you need to talk about their personal life in an interview. How to determine fair market value and how to establish accountability. So I hope you enjoy this episode and let's get to it. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Pavel. I know we've been trying to make this happen for several months now. So why don't you introduce everybody to who you are and what you do, and then we'll go from there. My name is Pavel Stepanov. I'm a founder and CEO of uh, VirtuDesk. So VirtuDesk is a virtual assistant company. We provide virtual assistance for small and medium-sized businesses. And uh, we've been in business for five years. It's going to be on December 1st, our anniversary, fifth year anniversary. And that's who we are. I believe you have several hundred employees. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, we have over 600 uh, employees in the Philippines and in the United States. So we are a multi-million dollar company. We made it to Inc. 5000 uh, this year. Congrats on the recognition and on five years. That's definitely a long time to be doing anything, I think, these days. Everybody wants to build a business model, wants to exit and cash out. Not me. We're still doing it and kicking it. So what made you want to get into working with VAs and helping VAs to find work? Well, I was a real estate agent at a time. I hired a virtual assistant myself for my own business to help me with prospecting, administrative work. Uh, frankly, because I was so overwhelmed at a time that I was working about 70, 80 hours a week and doing selling real estate and staying up till like three, four in the morning, catching up on paperwork, running marketing. And I figured, listen, I'm doing it. Actually, I'm making good money. However, I have no time to enjoy what I'm doing to enjoy the money to actually spend time with the family. So my greatest obstacle was actually how do I make sure that people that I hire do as good of a work that I would do or I want them to do because in my mind was like, okay, nobody can do it better than me. So that's what actually pushed me to the level that I need to hire somebody to do it and teach them what I know so they can be a clone of me. And when I hired my first virtual assistant, I realized that this is how I can truly scale and spend more time with my family and actually delegate more tasks that helped me to actually grow as a business person and grow my company. So from that, the idea of actually building a virtual assistant company was born. And since I had the connection in the Philippines, I was able to do that. If I wanted to start with a VA just on my own or anyone listening, how would you start it? Would you focus on what kind of a personality you want? Would you focus on what needs you need to have uh, dealt with? Like, how do you prepare yourself for working with a VA? Hire for your weaknesses, not for your strengths. Usually if you're a good salesperson, but you're not good at analytical stuff and the administrative work, paperwork, 
hire people to do that, to do admin work, paperwork. Uh, the best way to do it is to sit down and write down on a piece of paper, what are your daily tasks? What do you do during the, the day? Like I wake up, I have to send emails, I have to you know make those phone calls, I have to set out those Zoom calls. So once you actually figure that out, you'll see, okay, those tasks can be outsourced to somebody else. Create some sort of like a standard operating procedure for your business, your SOP, and what things are actually delegatable and found some things are not. So those can be delegated. You actually delegate them to somebody. Those are not, they stay with you. That's the best way to start to figure out what you need to be done. So once you know what the operating procedures are that can be delegated, what your weaknesses are, how do you then go and find someone that could potentially do this for you? Once you figure out what tasks you're going to delegate, you need to create a job description. It's like the type of person you're looking for, the job duties, and you post the job description in uh, different uh, virtual assistant groups on social media or on uh, hiring websites. You can go to onlinejobs.ph, you can go to Indeed or whatever. So be prepared to receive thousands of resumes once you actually get the resumes of people, look at the relevant experience that those candidates have and schedule interviews with those people. Look at the personality, look at what they've done, look at if they have any prior work experience like what you're requiring and just do interviews like you would be for any kind of person who would show up at your office for a job interview. Are there any specific questions that you think someone should ask a potential VA in an interview or uh, a specific kind of a skills test that could should be administered? And like, how do you think about and plan for those? Well, if you're hiring a virtual assistant who is located in the Philippines, look for a relevant experience of them working in a call center. Because when they hire people at call centers, they conduct English aptitude tests. And those call centers usually service Fortune 500 companies like Bank of America, Amex, Comcast. Once you actually hire somebody who is uh, from a call center industry, then those people will have great command of the English language. At the same time, they have experience working at a U.S. company and they understand American mentality better. Once you schedule interviews, the questions you should ask, obviously, about relevant experience. But keep in mind that it's actually a good idea to ask them about personal life, about their interest, about what they like. Because everybody can actually get prepared for a job interview and talk about stuff they did, stuff they didn't do, stuff they know how to do. That's not hard to do. But once you actually start engaging person in more of a non-official setting, ask them about, okay, what do you like doing? What do you like watching? Do you like watching sports? What's your favorite team? Who's your favorite player? What kind of plays you like? So that lets the person open up a little bit more to you because they subconsciously get to you on the level of more of a, like a friend than a potential boss. So that lets you evaluate them better in the sense that they can be opening up better than compared to what they actually prepared for job interview. I love specifically asking people strange questions they've probably never thought of before just to catch them off guard and see how they think. Yeah, exactly. Like I'll ask them, if you could move through time, where would you go? Why would you go there? What would you do? Like what's your goal now? Things that like the average person never thinks about on a daily basis, but really challenges them. And I think it's important because if you're going to be working with this person, you're probably going to be working with them a lot. And if you don't like them as a person, and you probably won't want to work with them. Well, that's true. You got to you gotta basically like the person who's working with you. I don't, I don't say work for you. I say you're actually working with you all the time. That's what I tell my employees. We work together. I, there's people working with me, not for me. The reason being is because, again, I want to make sure that people understand we're all working on the same team. We have the same goals. We have the same work tasks pretty much. And that's exactly what I want them to do. I want them, I want people to open up and be able to have a decent, meaningful conversation. Not just say yes, sir, you know, no, sir. Which is very common in the Philippines. I, I have, I think, nine or 10 team members from the Philippines. They're calling me Boss Pavel. I said, oh, please don't do this. I've been called sir in interviews. And I'm like, look, come on. I'm your age or younger. Come on. <laughs> yeah, they call you Sir Sean. We try to eliminate that as a, it's not part of our culture. So those who work with us for a long time, for uh, like five years, they already know that. They just call me by my first name. Go back to something real fast. You had said, it's important that everyone know that you're working together, not they're working for you. Have you ever heard of someone say that they work for their employees? Oh yeah, of course. I've heard it. That's how I feel. 
because like I know they're busy doing their very specific things, but in the background, I'm hustling, trying to get more money for the company, trying to make sure that I can feed them every month. And that's what I do every day. When we travel for all those conventions, expos, we're actually spending almost every day in airplanes. Yeah, we are working for our employees. I remember before I started my entrepreneurial journey, I always complained about how my bosses sucked and they didn't treat me very well. And then I became one and I was like, actually, I can understand what they're going through, but still be cognizant of like being nicer to the people I work with. Exactly. So we have an idea of who we want to hire, why we want to hire them, what we need them to do, how we're going to interview them. The next and most important thing I think people need to think about is contracts and wages. And what are some things people should be thinking about when putting together a contract for working with a VA? Are they a full-time employee? Are they an outside contractor? Are they a freelancer? Like, how are they considered, I guess, legally? If you're hiring somebody in the United States, uh, that person can be a contractor. If you're hiring somebody directly in another country, the money you pay them, you would not be able to write it off on taxes. So this person would have no status because there is no provision in the U.S. for you to write off foreign employees or foreign contract. That's why, you know, when you hire somebody from Virtudesk, you're basically hiring U.S. corporation. You can 1099 us. So like... Is it necessary to have an employment contract then? It's better to have an employment contract for two reasons. Why? Number one, it actually creates that sort of relationship in their mind and in your mind that you have certain formal relationship and certain expectations of pay, of when to pay. It actually formalizes your relationship. And second, it creates that job description that you need to have. You need to speak with a lawyer to discuss about enforceability. I have some doubt about that, but my hunch, you won't be able to if it's somebody in another country. How do you know what is a fair market value that you can pay them? Find out what other entrepreneurs like you are paying to their VAs. You can ask what they're expecting to get paid. It's the same thing like when you're hiring somebody in the United States to work for your company. How do you know what to pay? You have to look at what your market is or what certain positions are being paid. So you need to like figure that out. Again, we at Virtual Desk, we took that guesswork out of the equation. We know what the market value is. Uh, when we hire people, we know what, what we're paying them. Also keep in mind that they're going to be asking for in constant increases to the pay. If you hire somebody directly, it's not unusual that the aunt gets sick, uncle gets hit by a bus, somebody goes to the hospital, dog dies. So they're going to need money for this and that and that house burned down. So expect to be bombarded, you know, with different constant weird requests. I've seen it all, to be honest with you. And we've learned how to sift through this. Yes. And we have certain policies. Sometimes they can ask you, Hey, Sean, can I get an advance because I'm shopping for a car? Can I get an advance because I, my house burned down. I need to move to a different place. Can I get a loan from you? There are tons of mistakes that new employers can make by giving those advances. Let's say somebody right now already has a VA that they've been working with directly and they start to receive these kinds of requests. How do you handle it in a way that gets it to stop without ruining the relationship that you have with them? Or is that not possible? It's possible to be professional and say, well, we have a working relationship. That's again, we're going back to the contract and I would actually write it out in a contract that your pay is only going to be conditioned on those, on those terms. I would actually prescribe in the contract that there's not going to be any advances paid out or any loans given that's against your company policy. Once you actually establish those expectations right at the beginning, I think that's the way to do it. If you don't have the contract, you're paying them upon the job done. You know, sometimes it can happen. So I guess you got to show your mental toughness and say no to this and be prepared to lose an employee in case they decide to go. Because again, there's nothing, nothing is guaranteed in life. If somebody's trying to take your kindness for your weakness, then probably it's best to part ways with those people from the get-go. Those who are serious and they actually like working with you and uh, they'll be working with you for a long time, they know better not to take advantage of that and know better not to mooch off of you. But if it happens, I'd say cut your losses and uh, be prepared to do another hire. We found someone we want to work with. We have a contract signed with them. We know how much we're going to be paying them. What are the most common ways of paying VAs? We have a bank account in the Philippines, so we pay from that Filipino's bank account. But it depending on your volume and how many VAs you have. If you have one or two, you can obviously pay them with a PayPal. 
Um, you're probably going to have to eat those PayPal fees. But if you have several hundred, then it's probably going to find a different way of doing it. The best is probably would be by doing the direct wire from the bank account to the bank account in the Philippines. That's what I would do. Until recently, we were using crypto. We were using uh, USDT Tether. And because of the Ethereum network becoming so clogged, the fees were getting up to $50 for each transaction. So it cost the company $900 this month for salaries, $900 for 14 transactions. So I decided instantly I'm pulling all of the money out of crypto, converted it to Singapore dollars because we're a Singaporean company. And I got everyone onto TransferWise. So now we're going to start using TransferWise and it's like a dollar per transaction. Pretty good. Yeah. So we deposit the money from the bank account into a corporate WISE account. Mm -hmm. And then we do an inter-WISE transfer to their bank account in like pesos or whatever. So we pay for the conversion, but there's no transaction fee. And then like they pay a fee, I guess to get it to their bank account, which is probably like a dollar. So we have an idea of how we want to pay them. How frequently should we be paying them? Once every two weeks. That's what we're paying. Again, keep in mind, Sean, you need to pay how your business works, not how it's convenient for them. They would love to get paid every day. You actually set up the rules. You're the employer and you set up how your company is running, not how they want to get paid. Okay. You need to be firm, but nice. And you have certain rules and systems, how you do it. We bill our clients on the 10th and the 25th of every month. Our employees getting paid also twice a month. Most Asian companies will pay once a month. I was always paid once a month. Yeah. So that's what I decided to do for my company. Because like, if you pay every two weeks, it's a hassle to have to arrange everything every two weeks. And so like once a month, it makes it a lot easier, saves on uh, HR time. It's that's fine, yeah, because you save uh, time on billing, on HR and accounting and uh, fees again if you're transferring money. In the Philippines, they have 13th month pay. Uh, also, keep that in mind. Yeah, we don't do that. Well, no, I, I know we don't. Yeah, we're not a Filipino company. We also provide them with medical benefits, vision, dental, life insurance. Yeah, paid time off, sick lift, vacation pay. So this is something that our clients don't see what they have, but that's what we provide to them. That's awesome that you do that. I think it's really important. I've heard so many horror stories of, of virtual assistants being just basically abused. I know. It happens. Because again, people who hire them, they need to learn that they're actually human beings. You know, they're not robots. They're not a, a service. They're not like a software. It's a human being with a story, with, the, with their own feelings, with their own fears, with mouths to feed. So I wish more companies would actually recognize that because this is what the reality is. Just because they're in a different country, that doesn't make them less of a human. I think it's easier for you to see that because you, I believe you emigrated to America as, a, as an adult. Yeah, I emigrated to the United States 25 years ago. So you can see what it's like from your original country and America and the differences of how people are treated at work. So like, for, like in my situation where I worked in the US and I worked in China and I saw the differences from the employee's point of view and an employer's point of view. And so I got to understand how I can take some of that Western mentality into Asia and treat them the way Americans are treated. So how can you get the best performance from a VA? You got to keep them accountable. In order to do that, you need to set certain plan. We have for different departments, let's say our marketing, we have two meetings per week. Then throughout the week, the marketing director has daily meetings with them on different projects. In the marketing department, they have sub-departments who's responsible for the YouTube, who's responsible for social media, who's responsible for blogging, for email content. All of that, they collaborate together, but we still hold them responsible and accountable on a weekly basis. So if you want to see quality, you got to actually make sure that you don't just put it on autopilot and let it fly on its own. They, you have to actually drive it. You have to keep them accountable. You have to set goals and you have to set expectations and you got to keep them accountable on their goals uh, meetings, how they're actually going to meet their goals, what they're going to do. Uh, you need to let them think how they're going to do it, not just simply, okay, here's a task. Boom. I expect it to be done on Friday. No, it doesn't work that way. You got to keep them accountable. That's how you're going to get quality. Do you suggest tying incentives like bonuses or time off for them completing projects or like with, like with regular employees? 
only for sales positions where actually bonus is tied to the specific performance of the sales. It's hard to tie bonus to any like admin work, something that is not sales specific because you can throw money at a problem, but it's not going to fix the problem. You got to work at actually fixing the problem. You got to realize where their strengths and weaknesses are of each of your individual virtual assistants, where they're struggling, where you need to fix it. Just you say, okay, if you complete this task by Monday, you're going to get paid $200. No, it doesn't work that way because listen, they can show you it's completed, but you don't know how well it's completed. If you want to bonus somebody, of course you can. I mean, nobody's going to say no to that, but would it fix your problem? I don't think so. I'm thinking about hiring for my podcast company. I'm looking in 2022 to expand, to provide services that are money generating because until now I've done this and uh, have had no focus on making any money. And I'm approaching a hundred episodes that are published. So I think it's a good time to start thinking about that. One of the things that I do that is very tiring for me is posting questions on Help a Reporter, going through the answers, you know, filtering out who I want to contact, contacting them, making sure they agree to post it on social media, preparing the information to be published, scheduling introduction calls that could be potential guests for the podcast, doing the intro calls, doing the recordings, publishing, editing, promotion, etc. So as you can see, it, it could be a full-time job just for this thing, just for all of those things. I know that I need an editor. That's a, a no-brainer. I only need one editor. I was thinking of hiring an assistant to help me with all of the non-editing slash recording stuff. Mm -hmm. That kind of falls into everything I just mentioned, which is like preparing the articles, publishing the articles, promoting the articles. And I was thinking of also having them work on social media as well to kind of build up more engagement and create lead generation for the services that we're going to provide because my time will be spent on doing the intro calls, doing the recordings and providing the services that people pay for. But with that in mind, do you recommend one VA who can do everything that's not editing where it's like all of the admin stuff and the social media stuff or a person for admin and a person for social media? I do a person for admin and person for social media. And let me explain to you why. It's different skill sets. And uh, obviously somebody who would be fully dedicated to certain department within your podcast company. And it will be with the administrative part of it. They're really going to be handling only admin stuff and the social media. It's mostly tied to marketing. If you're like running a uh, you know, very tight budget, you can probably stretch it very thin and have one person do both. But again, we're talking about quality. The more you grow, the person is going to be buried with work and the quality will start to decline. So you want to make sure that person is not overworked because that's, you know, it's it's your company. You cannot have the Jack and Jill of all trades. So you need to have somebody who's laser focused on one specific aspect of your business. Because God forbid something happens, he gets hit by a bus. Somebody else will step in and handle that while the other part of your business is not being affected. I was kind of hoping to have one person do both, at least in the beginning. The way I run the business, I hire people in anticipation of what's going to be done instead of being reactionary. The reason is we want to make sure we actually have the bandwidth and we want to make sure we have actually we actually prepared. Because, for example, we have several teams. Each virtual assistant works in a separate team of VAs. It's like 25, 30 VAs in one team. So we hire a team lead for each team and an assistant team lead. So the way it works is, let's say we have 40 clients right now who are willing to hire virtual assistants. We're going to get, get them those virtual assistants. So once we actually have those virtual assistants, we need to create a team. Okay. We're creating a team. So we're not going to be looking for a team leader to actually take over the team. We already have team lead ready to go who will be building that team. So that's what we do. We anticipating instead of being reactionary. That's how you actually grow. If you're doing more of a, like a reactionary hiring, you would probably suffer with the uh, quality of the people and the structure, because then basically you're introducing new person into the existing business instead of that person growing with you. At first, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but it's going to be better in the long run to actually have two people do it. So is there anything I haven't asked that you think would be relevant to this conversation? My mentality is go big or go home, which is kind of hard for some people to swallow. In order to grow, you got to actually think 10 steps ahead of what you're doing. You need to have a certain plan as far as not only what you're trying to do, but a step-by-step -step plan of execution. Your virtual assistant is a reflection of your business, of how you are running the company. If you think your virtual assistant sucks after working with you for a certain number of years, you need to look at your business model. You need to look at your organization 
what went wrong there. Even if that was a wrong hire, that's your fault, not your VA's fault. So think of that. When you are growing, your virtual assistant is growing with you, basically. Delegate more tasks to them. Start, you know, hiring more people, maybe in their circle of friends that they have for certain positions. Sometimes we've been creating positions just for the right person. Right person comes along, we like him, we want to hire this person, we want him to be part of a team. We create the position for him. And guess what? Most of the time, it's actually a right decision to do that. So retain good people and fire bad ones. And again, uh, probably the biggest advice that you've heard a lot, hire slow, fire fast. I've heard all of those things for sure. And and every time I hear them, it makes me smile because uh, like almost everybody says the same thing. Yeah, exactly. All right, great. So how can people follow up with you? My name is Pavel Stepanov. They can, they can look me up on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or uh, they can just go to our website, myvirtuedesk.com and schedule a, a discovery call. It's myvirtuedesk.com. All right. Thank you very much for your time and your energy, Pavel. I really appreciate it. If you like this episode, definitely follow up with him. If you know anyone that's thinking about hiring a VA, then definitely share this episode with them. And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day and take care of your team because they'll take care of you too. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you, Sean.